Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time again for another episode of Health Talks with Dr. Trin. The one show, the only show that shows you the path to a healthier life, one conversation at a time. And today, well, you're going to have to uh, wrap your head around some uh, wild concepts here, as Dr. Trin likes to go into this whole idea of telemedicine and alternative health, and in this case, artificial intelligence. How are we going to use artificial intelligence to live healthier, happier, stress-less lives? Is that the topic today we're talking All about? Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Paul. And uh, welcome, Mr. Harry Glorikian from Massachusetts, right? Close to Boston. Yes, I'm sh- yes. yes. Good excited. to be here. Excited you're here. I know you've written two books and you're on the uh, investor side and uh, have done a lot of innovative projects with innovation. So when we saw your name cross our path, we're like really excited to bring you on and just kind of have you chat and have this as an open forum so we can learn more about what you do, who you are, and the books that you've written, especially when it comes to uh, healthcare and artificial intelligence and things of that sort. Excellent. Great to be here. Look forward to it. All right. Let's give us an overview of the book that you wrote that took me forever to type into the title here. It's definitely got a lot of uh, bold statements in it. Give us the name of the book that you wrote on this topic, and then that'll kind of frame the discussion here today. What's the book called? So the book is called The Future You, How Artificial Intelligence Can Help You Get Healthier, Stress Less, and Live Longer. How Mm. in the world can artificial intelligence, this thing that tracks my habits on social media and predicts the algorithms of a financial trades and all these other things that artificial intelligence does possibly help me in my real world, real life? So in reality, I don't think people realize they're using it every day and it is actually making their life a whole lot easier. So if you do a Google search and it gives you what you want, there's a you know strong taste of artificial intelligence behind that. Right. When you're speaking to Siri or Alexa, there's you know artificial intelligence in there. It is everywhere, except you don't really know that it's there. And that's the best kind of technology, the kind that helps you and you don't even have to think about it. Right. And so the same thing applies in healthcare, where whether it be my Apple watch that I'm wearing or my whoop band, right? The information that it digests, processes, and then says, hey, this is sort of what's going on and makes you aware of how you can improve your health. That's a lot of complex calculations going on. It's just making it, putting it to you in a very simplified way so that you can do something actionable. So let me ask you one more question. We'll let Dr. Trin chime in here. I've often wondered, could artificial intelligence, could this robot help analyze the complex, confusing data that a patient provides, the verbal cues, the physical cues, the charts and everything, and come up with a quicker, better diagnosis? Could, because we've talked about how under the pressure of the modern medical system, doctors are forced to, they only got a few minutes with you, you got to get in and get out, Medicare only pays for so much, their practices designed to get people through quickly and whatnot, and they're trying to make a lot of complex conclusions rather quickly. And I wonder if that wouldn't be assisted by artificial intelligence, if it couldn't get down to the root of the cause quicker, and then they could make some more intelligent choices. Is that ever in the cards? The short answer is yes. Okay. It, it just depends on you know how it gets implemented, but some of that is already happening now. If, if you go to like Stanford has their own algorithm, which will look at all the medical record information, right? and it can actually predict with a very high accuracy if you could die within the next year. Wow. And then they will approach you and have that sort of, do you have your life together? We're seeing this as a potential, right? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And the more data the system gets, the more accurate it gets over time. There are systems that do remote patient monitoring. So if you're a primary care doctor Mm -hmm. and your patients have these kits and they're taking their measurements, instead of seeing them that one time, you've got a a, a longitudinal view of data over over time. And so you can manage that patient better. And actually you can manage more patients because there's a more automation put into play. Mm-hmm. So those are just two examples, but there's a lot more. What do you think, Dr. Trin? We've talked about this too. Would It's not just is the technology available, would doctors use it? Would they listen to a robot's assessment? Would they listen to an algorithm 
and use that as a tool and not as a threat. Well, I know better than that does it. I've got 20 years experience. I think most of us already go on Google and put in our symptoms. <laughs> to, to look for that diagnosis. And what's interesting is, can artificial intelligence be that initial triage person before it gets to the doctor? Kind of like an AI nurse that triages, you know, why you're here, what are your symptoms, and kind of help narrow that diagnosis gap, right, <laughs> to assist. Yeah, there are systems that where when you get to the office, you answer a number of questions and it goes through the same algorithm that's a, you know, you learned in med school, right? When it is, it's not bad and sort of go through it to narrow it down to something. But where I see these systems being used, you know, because I try to read as many of the papers as I can, as you say, well, the doctor is this level of accuracy and the AI system is this level. But when you put them together, the accuracy automatically goes up. Right? So it's the two together that get to that next level. And that's where I see the symbiotic relationship between the physician and let's face it, I, we keep calling it AI, but it's just a tool. Right. Just a tool. Right? And that tool is giving you a piece of information. And then you have to make that judgment call mm. on top of what the tool is telling you. And if you think about it, right, like if you think about a diagnostic test or a, an x-ray image or... It, that's a tool that's giving you, this is just taking a lot more data, crunching it and giving you more of an analysis out of it. So should doctors view it as such? To, it's You gave some perfect examples. Uh, we now have, you know, in the last century, x-ray machines. We have other sorts of uh, technology that gives us greater insight into what's happening inside the patient. And there's a lot of data that all these uh, medical devices are collecting now and medical procedures. This is a way to crunch that data quickly and come up with some possible alternatives. But I would think that, and maybe it's, I've been reading too many science fiction novels, that doc doctors would be afraid of this, that they would think, I'm going to be replaced by this. They don't need the doctor. The robot, the artificial intelligence can play chess faster than I can. So why do I need to have a real player there? I mean, fortunately, healthcare is it's different it's than just choosing one move in chess, right? the chessboard won't argue back, right? The <laughs> right. <patient. laughs> You've yeah. got to interact with another human being. So you really do need that human interaction. But this may sound a little controversial, like at this moment in time, although based on everything that's going on, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. I think that physicians that are not adopting this or healthcare systems that are not implementing this are really on the border of not practicing the highest quality of medicine that they could. Yeah. If that AI system identifies a tumor or a fracture or, you know, a bleed in the head, and that makes a difference in how quickly or how accurately that patient gets treated and you're not using it, that's a problem. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't want to get legal about it, but it seems like you're not giving the best diagnosis. You're making life and death determinations in some cases with not all the data or the best data or, or analyzing the data correctly. And again, because... How can you, in this world of medicine where it's become, I hate to say it, more like an assembly line, but I've said that before, you mm -hmm. got to get people in and out quickly. We're trying to reduce costs. We're trying to control, contain costs and everything here. In the process, we're giving the doctor less and less time to ask questions, to think, to investigate other possibilities. And AI would crunch a lot of those things for them, I would think. Well, think about it this way, right? If your washing machine or your car is getting close to breaking down, right, the light goes on, right? Mm -hmm. right. There's a system in there monitoring that all the time. When you have somebody in the intensive care unit, there are pieces of software that can sit there and all the beeps and all the boops and, you know, everything that's going on and basically right. say, hey, bed seven, you guys should take a look at them because in the next 48 to 72 hours, the data is showing that they could crash. Right. So you may want to intervene now. How many, like a human being, cannot monitor the beeps and the boops like on a momentary basis to see mm -hmm. what's going on? It's just not, that's not how we're designed as, right. as right. beings, right? But the machine can sit there and be your assistant to say, hey, doctor, you may want to take a look at this, right? It crossed the threshold. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big help for what we can do today versus what we did I mean, five years ago, I mean, I give you a simple example. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, if you just wanted to take your blood pressure, you probably had to go to a hospital or a right. clinic or something. I mean, yeah. I have this 
portable blood, blood pressure guy, push a button, it takes the measurement. I don't even have to think about it. Boom, it shows up on my iPhone and it shows me how the trend is going over time. Mm -hmm. Technology is sort of making mm -hmm. what was really complex a whole lot easier. How does that play into Dr. Trin's favorite topic here, which is telehealth, telemedicine? The idea oh. that patients can be monitored yes. for a lot of things at home, even after they've gone in, he had somebody on a while ago, even if you go in for surgery, why keep you there if we're just monitoring, you know, I don't know, various sorts of things. We, we got to keep you in the hospital because only we can monitor this stuff. Why? Maybe this stuff could be set up to be monitored at home and get you home faster, which saves money and makes you happier and everything. How does this play into that whole telehealth field? I think... That's a total door opener to telehealth. And I know that people do not like the pandemic. I don't like the pandemic, but right. boy, the pandemic changed telehealth. Yeah. Right. right? Before the pandemic, it was, ah, I don't need this. During the pandemic, it's like, where's my telehealth system? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> How quickly can I get that stood up? And so, you know, I've been talking to remote patient monitoring companies and we're seeing tremendous uptake in primary care uh, offices where so here's the issue right you give somebody a blood pressure thing they take the measurement how do you get that back into your system exactly and whoever sees how do you, it how do, the doctor's yeah, busy yeah. and what who in the chain is responsible does it send an alert does it and who does it send it to and then what happens afterwards and all that yeah right and so when you have these turnkey systems right the system goes through your all your patients it looks at them and says okay the cardiac condition it looks at the codes and it says, here's the box of items that should go to that patient. And they get it. And then all they need to do is plug in a hub that doesn't even work on Wi-Fi. It works off cellular. So it doesn't have, you don't have to worry about your Wi-Fi going down. And every time you take a measurement, it just uploads into the doctor's system. And every morning, whoever's out of line shows yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And then the system can send a message to the nurse saying, hey, call, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, mm -hmm. right? or if it's really serious, okay, the doctor should respond to this. But all of a sudden, you can manage a lot of patients. And oh, by the way, your ability to bill for this, you've got all the records. Mm, that's right? So it's it's a revenue generator as well as you provide better service to the patients. Has that been part of the ob ob objection? Is it all just, as my late father would say, it all comes down to money? Money's the answer, now what's the question? Is it just a cost <laughs> of money you know, of either implementing this or in reverse, gee, if they don't come in, I don't get billed. I can't bill them. Well, I mean, these are, you know, jobs and, mm -hmm. you know, these people are entrepreneurs and they have to run their businesses, right? You can't, right. you go to the tire shop, he doesn't do it for you for free, right? Right. It's everything costs something. And so there is a cost to it. And so if somebody can figure out a way to, you know, if, if I'm CEO of a company and somebody asked me to invest in something, I want to see the ROI, right? right? Otherwise, why am I going to implement that in my business? Right. It's just, this is now at a point where I think mm -hmm. the ROI for both groups, not us, the entrepreneur, but the patient that's being served really goes way high on both sides. What do you and think? Both benefit, which is a unique situation. What do you think, Dr. Trin? Is it all about money? I've been thinking that doctors are just resistant to change and resistant to do something where they don't see the patient because that's how they do it and that's what they feel comfortable with. And it's a uh, cultural thing. It depends on if you're a doc who is within 10 years of retirement or if you just get out of school. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> the younger the docs love technology. They're ready for technology and they grew up with technology. Some of the older docs, they, they like to see and touch and have you in person to discuss that. But certainly, you know, technologies like remote patient monitoring has been shown to be able to decrease uh, patients' uh, risk for being hospitalized or heading to the ER. Uh, when I tell my patient to, um, you know, check your blood pressure at home and see me back in three months, they see me back in three months and they bring this big package of blood pressure readings over the last three months. And I look at it and I say, I should have addressed this two months ago when it was super high and you never told me about it. And, and that could have been an ER visit, you know, that I could have prevented. So this is where remote patient monitoring and artificial intelligence may play a huge role because you get to know what's going on in your patient's life real time rather than looking back three months later at their blood pressure reading, their blood sugar readings, whatever you're monitoring, right? And this is an opportunity to be proactive.
when you see conditions that pop up, that you're using artificial intelligence or you're using these tools to get that red light, right? Pop up. This is a emergency that needs to be addressed now rather than finding out that your patient's in the emergency room. So what do you think, Dr. Trin? Uh, he mentioned, your guest mentioned that maybe COVID was a tipping point. You're, you're in the front lines here. What do you see? It was COVID a tipping point for Absolutely. remote monitoring? Absolutely. Absolutely. When everything closed down and including doctor's offices and, and nobody wants to walk into an office or a hospital, the only way we could deliver care was telemedicine. And then we realized, wow, this is kind of convenient. And maybe quicker. And maybe I get an answer because I found myself in the pandemic. And even before then, something happens late at night and all the round the clock emergency rooms and stuff have been scaled back and there's no place to go and the little emergency room down the block that you i thought stayed open around the clock now only stays open till nine o'clock and it's 10 o'clock and my grandchild just swallowed something or he's making funny faces or he's looking sick and i say where do i go how do i get an answer so i think it gives a lot of relief to the patients you can get quicker access i think the doctors as you say can respond better and get more stay more in the loop what is the final hurdle to adoption? Is it just us getting used to this technology and hard to use it? Is it paying for it? Is it finding ways to bill people when I read the reports and bill Medicare? What, what do you think? Uh, I'll go back to our guest here. What do you think the final barriers are to adoption? Well, I, I think it's got to be an easy to use system. That, that's first of all, right? It's got to be easy to implement. It's got to be turnkey, right? You, can't, you cannot ask the, the physician or their office to be the IT help desk. Okay. So th that needs to just magically happen, and that's happening. Right. You need to be able to get the right equipment to the right patients, right? A and that's happening, right? And then you need to be able to bill for it because, again, this is part of the services that are being provided. That's the way medicine set up, pay for service, pay for fee. Yes. And so yeah. if they're going to put effort into this and treat it seriously, then doctors should be and will expect to be compensated for the time they put into this, right? Correct. Or even value-based care where you, what you're being paid for is outcomes, right. keeping somebody healthy. You know, you do that and all of a sudden you find out if you're not monitoring them, it's really hard to keep them healthy. Right. right. And so once you have those pieces in place, it's sort of, I've interviewed a couple of these customers of these systems and they love it. Mm -hmm. Um, it just makes their life so much easier uh, where they don't have to wonder why their blood pressure went off the scale. Like, you know, at that moment, like they can intervene. Right. I mean, if you think about it, you know, this little unit I'm holding up, which is the size of a credit card, I put my two fingers on each side and it's called, it's from a company called the Live Core. It'll do a six parameter ECG of my heart. Wow. 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 Right. $80. Yeah. Right. The AI will look at the pattern and tell mm -hmm. me if there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm at home and I'm, I feel like something's happening, right? I can get on my telehealth system yep. and use this. I mean, it's not as good as, uh, you know, the right. ones at the hospital, but it's getting better and better, like all the time Yeah. between that, this blood pressure cuff and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe another device. And all of a sudden that physician and or nurse has information that they wouldn't have had five minutes ago. Real data, they, so can, they can make, make a, a decision. difference with the patient. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm waiting for that blood sugar monitor without a needle. Wouldn't that be so? I don't have it on now, but yes. I've had the continuous glucose monitor on my arm. I'm not diabetic, I'm perfectly right. healthy, thank God. But I use it to figure out like what foods spike me mm -hmm. because there's so many people that are pre diabetic and don't mm -hmm. know it. Mm -hmm. And so you can be wearing that and just take your patch? phone and wave it over that and see what your blood sugar is. Is it a, a patch or it require a micro needle to kind It of is a micro needle, but you can't feel it. I mean, I once it's in, first of all, I never, I didn't feel it going in. And then the second wow. thing is, you know, after a day, I'd forget it was there because wow. I'd be like taking a shower and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot it's on my arm. But Amazing. after every meal, you can just wave your phone over it and it'll give you your blood sugar levels. So this NFC technology. Yeah. Near field. Yeah. It, well, it's using, it's yeah. using Bluetooth basically Bluetooth. to, yes. right. To pick up the data. I love it. And you can send that to your doctor. You can look at it on the app yourself. I mean, the new update to the Apple watch. Right. Well, actually when you go into AFib will actually automatically record. Yes. The AFib event. Wow. Wow. So yes. you can share that with your doctor. Wow. All right. So 
If I look at it this way, if you're young, you know, technology can sort of help you keep in the right track, which will hopefully push off any bad dynamics. Right. If you're older, it can help you monitor, keep you healthier and, you know, sort of maybe course correct bad habits. Yes. And then yes. if you've got a chronic disease, it can actually help you monitor that chronic disease much more accurately. And yeah. we all know the better you monitor that chronic disease, like something like diabetes, yep. you know, those comorbidities or the other things that the diabetes causes go down. Just for our audience sake, the patch with the, the blood sugar monitor, is it something they can get like on Amazon or is it something you're just testing out? Unfortunately, in the United States, technically you cannot get it out, get it without a prescription from a physician. Although there are two companies now, mm -hmm. uh, one called January AI, uh -huh. And the other one called Levels. Huh. And you call them up, you go through a questionnaire, a physician will then prescribe this to you and it shows up. Hmm. No way. Levels? Yep. L-E-V-E-L-S. -E -E and January AI is the other company. Do you have any um, connection with them? And we'd love to talk to them about that. I'm going to be future guests maybe for the show here because I didn't know anything like that exists. I didn't know. Yeah, that oh, yeah, yeah. All And by the way, all of these things we're talking about and yeah. more, all of that is covered in the book. Okay. Wow. Oh, good. Okay. That's what I'm trying to right. get at. Just okay. try, trying to bring it down to anybody should be able to read the book and really understand where things are today and right. where things are going. Mm -hmm. I see. Levels health. Uh, unlock yep. your metabolic health. I found it. Okay. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Very. So very while exciting. Dr. Trin's looking these things up, tell us what you're doing in this field. You're, you're not just writing books about it. You're actually an active entrepreneur or VC, or are you investing in things or helping develop things or what are you working on? Uh, yes. So I'm a, my, my day job or how right. I pay the bills would be, I'm, I'm in venture. Uh, I'm a partner in a venture fund. Mm -hmm. uh, we actively invest in that intersection of biology and data. Mm -hmm. So it can be something near the patient like we're talking about, or it could be how to discover and develop drugs faster. So it's a pretty wide remit. Wow. So I spend my time looking at companies, talking to companies, coaching companies, investing companies, and then I write my books because that really forces me to stay on the bleeding edge. Right. Yep. Um, and I have a podcast where I interview ah. people there you go. on the bleeding edge, trying to understand those little nuanced details of why and what and how and who, right? Give mm. us the name of the podcast. Let's give it a plug here. It's uh, the Harry Glorikian show. It's pretty simple. It's my name. All right. <laughs> and, my name. and let's spell your name for those of us that are challenged with names here. How do we spell that? So Harry, H-A-R-R-Y, and last name is G-L-O-R-I-K-I-A-N. Okay. All right. And we can find that wherever podcasts are found, I'm assuming here. Hey, yeah. You, if you just type the, the Harry Glorican show, it, sh it should come up. Um, it's syndicated everywhere. So I don't know whether you know, but this uh, studio, this uh, station that it runs over this unique internet radio station is streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center. Fancy word for a, a, what every campus is trying to come up with, a, a place, a space to take technology being developed on campus and turn it into something. Maybe it's licensing into others. Maybe it's actually build companies. So the building here is filled with v people like you, VCs, incubators, accelerators, coaches, yeah. mentors, and stuff, all as, as technology. Some of it's student-driven, but most of it's faculty-driven. As they're developing new ideas, and UCI is known for medical devices. That's kind of what their specialty is, medicines and medical devices. They have a, a, a wet lab here on the top floor where they're trying to develop new drugs. And then on the second floor, they have an incubator and accelerator program where they're trying to take technology, as well as a licensing program, try and take stuff and bring it to the business world and bring it to life, turn it into something. So we'd love to, if you're interested, I'd love to introduce you to the director of the program here because this place is filled with the kind of stuff you're looking for. And yeah, I know yeah. you're on the East Coast and we're on the West Coast and the two don't often meet, but this might be an interesting <laughs> connection for you here. I was born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, half my life was out there and half my life is here. So I'm a child of both coasts. Okay. So I love, I'd love it. I'll give you guys some examples that people can really like. Right. I mean, I know the, the continuous glucose monitor and the blood pressure should be something that people can implement today. But right. what if you had a child with ADHD? Yeah. Mm. Okay. What's typical, right? Somebody gets prescribed medication, Adderall, Ritalin, something right. like that. Right. What if I could prescribe them a video game? Mm. What? And they could play a video game. 
Right. And by playing that video game, it would strengthen that part of the brain that cannot stay focused. And by the way, it's FDA cleared. Uh, yeah. It's gone through a clinical trial. It is reimbursed and it is doctor prescribed. You can't just get wow. it. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Game changer. Yeah. Because I know people with children with ADHD and the difficulties they suffer in school and the people getting called in for parent teacher conferences. Your kid won't pay attention. He won't sit still. They're disruptive. Maybe they're even depressed because they're not fitting in or following along or all this other stuff here. And yeah, the yep. object has been to drug them up. And, right. and everybody's yep. saying there's got to be some other answer than keeping them drugged all the time here. Absolutely. Yep. What have you seen in the world of dementia and Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's a, Dr. Trin's specialty. Right. We do uh, clinical research, phase two, phase three for uh, dementia, Alzheimer's care. And so lots of technologies popping up for a, a cognitive screening technology yep. where you have medical devices like the CogniView device or medically cleared or you have straight out of the internet, uh, you can go on there and, and do a cognitive screen. I've seen those technology, those are all billable, but is there anything on the treatment side using AI? That's a, a huge uh, challenge. Obviously we're still looking for that magic drug, right? To remove the amyloid plaque and all that. But can we use AI, can we use technology to help slow down the decline of memory loss or to help improve somebody's, you know, brain function overall? Could there be a video game for that? Could there be a little memory test to strengthen your brain or something here and right. fight this decline? Well, if, if you remind me, I'm going to send you a paper uh, when we get off. There was a huge paper that came out where the fundamental amyloid plaque paper that got written, the data was fabricated. What? Uh, what? <laughs> oh my God. This so, is like a Paslava uh, study, the, right? <laughs> no, no, this, this just came out. I, I, I think it was published in Nature or Science. It was a big, it was a big, big deal that yes. everybody assumed the data was right. And then everything they did after that was based on that was data. So that. Millions of dollars went down the wrong road. Right. Basically. But that said, I mean, what we're doing is we're getting better at by screening, using AI to look at the images, et cetera, subclassifying patients better. That's, yes. that's one. Um, and let's stop you right using... there. Well, stop you right there for one second, because Dr. Trin has talked about this at length as he's done shows on, he's on the board of Alzheimer's OC here and, and he's had people in and they've talked about this at length, how difficult it is to categorize them correctly because there yes. isn't a blood test that says you have Alzheimer's, not yet. It's a guessing game and you rule out this, you rule out this, you rule out this and finally do it. And in the meantime, you're not treating the patient. The patient's not getting the right care. It might be this, it might be this, it might be a yeast infection that's making you uh, seem like dementia or something here, you know, all sorts of things. So uh, yeah. Yes, but I believe, and I could be wrong, there is one FDA now cleared blood test from Roche. Wow. Uh, literally, wow. I think it happened in the last month. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I haven't talked about that. It just got approved. I have not read, like, I think it's the first amyloid test for Alzheimer's disease that got FDA approved, yeah, but either, I cannot I, remember. Yeah, I saw that. I think it was Fast Track or something like that. I saw that headline. Because that's been one of the fundamental problems with that disease and getting the proper diagnosis is you're, you're okay. guessing. So, you're ruling out everything else until you can come up you with it. Yeah. Roche Alzheimer's blood test earns a FDA breakthrough. And I think there was another one from... Fuji Rebio, mm -hmm. but it, that is a uh, spinal fluid test, whereas uh, Roche's is a blood test. But I think they're looking at different things. Absolutely. So, so those are two examples. But let me give you a, another one that isn't Alzheimer's, but Parkinson's. Right. Yeah. So I just interviewed them for my podcast, and it's a company called Rune Labs, a bunch of software guys, mm -hmm. where they have come up with a piece of software that functions through the Apple Watch because Apple Watch has an API into their movement mm -hmm. right. uh, function. And they are able to tell you how well a treatment might be working with that patient because they can detect all the micro movements. Now, uh -huh. they also have a deal with Medtronic. Mm -hmm. And so- Which is next door to this have, building. Medtronic's uh, West Coast yeah. headquarters is right out here, yeah. Yeah, and so if they put in a deep brain stimulus yep. device, right, to help you. So 
imagine all that is picking up all your brain activity. Yeah. So you've got all the brain activity that's going into the system and you've got all the information coming off the, the Apple watch mm-hmm. as, the to, as the movement, technology. how, whether, whether you're still shaking and stuff here. Yeah. We've had a number of patients with uh, the deep brain stimulus and they, sometimes they overshoot and they freeze uh, huh. and, and other times, you know, yeah. So, uh, so having this data and then being able to, uh, adjust your treatment based on that is amazing. But sure. you can actually yeah. measure the movement, the tremors. Yes. And yes. so now you've got a triangulation capability yep. and just, I love talking to that company because you can see like how immediate that becomes. And then all that data allows you to say, well, wait a minute, this type of patient is different than that type of patient. Right. So maybe there's two types of Parkinson's going on here and we can start creating subclassifications just like we did with breast cancer. Mm-hmm. I never knew that anybody was looking to subcategorize. My mother, late mother had Parkinson's bad. And so I'm very familiar with the effects of that disease, including dementia that came out of it that we didn't know back then or weren't prepared for. Uh, and, and the side effects, the crippling side effects that come out of that. And everybody just shrugged and said, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing. Yeah, so in my experience, like every single time we label something with one big giant label, mm-hmm. it's not one label. There's probably three, four, five, ten variations on. I mean, we used to say breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Nobody says it's just breast cancer anymore. It's that's applied to it, and that drives a therapy, mm-hmm. right? right? And all the diseases are like that. There's not just one, <laughs> one, one version involved. and one treatment. Yeah, there's not and, just one yeah. version, right? Right. It's the Same multiverse, right? Word. Yeah, same thing with Alzheimer's and uh, and dementia. What about precision medicine and and cancer? Uh, I've seen the. Uh, you talking just about dosages and directing it to the tumor, or are you no, talking I, about measuring no, the, it, monitoring it? I've seen the blood tests availability of detecting precancer based on genetics and things of that sort. Uh, looking for a variety of of cancers through a, a blood test, just early detection. I cover all these in the book also. Yes. But essentially, when you think about it, because, I mean, I was uh, involved with, you know, I was I was at the company that did the Human Genome Project way back when. And wow. you learn a lot when you're doing that. But basically, if, if anybody who's listening, just to put it into think, every tumor is different. Yep. And every tumor has what I call a certain personality. <laughs> and so if you genetically sequence that tumor, you get to understand the personality of that tumor, and therefore you understand how you would attack it or manage it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, today, there are actual drugs that if you have a certain gene sequence, that drug will work on It's a targeted missile against that gene sequence. Mm-hmm. Right. right. So it will work more effectively than, oh, let me start with this, and then let me give you that, and if that doesn't work, let me get Because that's a guess. Right. 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 So this is more precision or targeted medication. Um, and we're getting, and now we're going to, well, what if we give you a combination, right? It's like whack-a-mole. If I hit enough of them, right. I'll take out the target. We've now figured out through neonatal blood testing mm-hmm. that we can also see in the blood tumor DNA that is sloughed off from cells that die. Wow. Right? Now we found that out by accident because when they were doing the original neonatal testing, Right. Somebody said, um, this doesn't look right. Mm-hmm. And we said, do we call her? <laughs> and tell her? Right. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we, we should. And, and of course they let her know. They found that there was a tumor there. She had the baby. They immediately were. And she said, this saved my life. So then it went on to, and then of course, nobody believed us that you could see something early. And by the way, the system didn't pay for it. <laughs> pay for early we're back detection. to that old problem. Yes. Yeah, right, what exactly. happens is yeah. where, can, where can we really focus our efforts? And it's therapy monitoring was the place where we spent our time. Mm-hmm. You had a tumor. We took out the tumor. Is the therapy we're giving you working or not? And so we can test your blood to see how well that therapy is working. Mm-hmm. Now everybody's really trying to move on to the early detection side. Right. But those are big, huge studies that need to be done over a number of years to really be sure, you know, how well we can detect it. And everybody talks about a pan cancer assay. I'm not sure if we'll have a pan cancer assay, but I think we could see enough of them. Liquid biopsy. Yeah, it's a liquid biopsy where every year you could go in, give a tube of blood, they do the screen and tell you, Paul, you're fine. A liquid right? biopsy. You throw out these terms casually. There's something I've never heard before. I don't have to cut yeah. out a piece and take it to a lab and tell you what it is. Is it benign or malignant? 
I can do a blood test and, as you yep. said, pan across a variety of can possible cancers and screen for stuff. That seems yeah. cutting edge. That seems uh, futuristic. That seems science it fiction. Today. No, it's today. I mean, there's a company in uh, Northern California called Garden Health, publicly traded. They do a lot of the therapy monitoring, and they're trying to move upstream to early detection. There's a company called Grail that Illumina bought. Uh, they're, you know, down in San Diego. Yeah. Um, and there's a number of companies out there that are, you know, trying to go down this road. Some hospital systems are trying to develop their own internally. But imagine that you can see it before the tumor forms. Yeah. Yes. Wow. What could you do to prevent the formation of the tumor or to flush it out or to or to prepare for it well, or whatever? We have tumors forming every day, though. I mean, tumor yes. cells form every day. It's, it's just that we never know about it because our immune system catches it mm. and yep. eradicates it. It's when it escapes the immune system is when we're in trouble. Oh, there you go. Right. Okay. Right. The body is an amazing... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely fascinating machine. I mean, it does a really good job managing itself. It's just when Dr. Trent said, you know, when something goes out of line that we need to go and then inter interfere. Give a plug again uh, for your one of your past guests, Dr. Trent. I know he's a friend of yours. I forgot the name of the company. Is it Neurologic or... Who's, who's the guy with all the remote monitoring stuff's been on? Oh, <laughs> that's News Logic. News Logic, yes, right. With, with uh, Juan Yu, who owns like three healthcare companies, but he's deep into uh, remote patient monitoring. And we actually went to Vietnam a few weeks ago, and he was on our team. We did medical missions work uh, in Vietnam, up in the highlands, up in the mountains. And, and he brought his devices, and we're trying to figure out how can we provide remote health patient monitoring to uh, folks who live in other countries yeah. and who, and who a, don't have access to a doctor, but could maybe be fitted with something simple to, but they have a cell phone, right? Yeah. Like, have access. <laughs> There are things like that that are happening where somebody goes in, they get a diagnostic test and the result is sent by a cell phone. You know, there's remote systems that you can use that will uplink through a cell phone. I've seen very small diagnostic devices where they've taken all the brains out of the machine. Mm -hmm. It's just the testing system. And then it shoots all the data over to a cell phone and the cell phone is the, the brains that then, but I can see how these technologies we're talking about will make I mean, you could see universal health care for places that never had it. Yeah, that's what they're talking about. Uh, the, the fact that, you know, Dr. Trin, in addition to all the things he does, has this thing called tongue out. They do medical missions. He brings UCI medical students and uh, doctors and ordinary people and takes them up where he's from, where he's familiar, up into the highlands of Vietnam. They go visit people in remote areas that haven't seen a doctor in forever and go to other countries as well. But that whole notion of taking medicine to the people, of turning that cell phone into a diagnostic and communications tool. Because wherever they are, they have cell phone technology. And the most rural villages in India or Africa may not have clean water, but they have a, a, a clear signal. And dirt poor, dirt poor, don't know where their next meal is coming from, and they have an Android cell phone in their hands. <laughs> That's how it is well, but, in the world. Yeah. But think about it, right? I mean, Musk deployed Starlink for and receivers for, you know, Ukraine. Yeah. Changed the game and of their yeah. community. If you had Starlink or something like that where there there could be a communication link from anywhere. Right. Now it's, you know, it's whether you're streaming YouTube or you're streaming, you know, medical data, right. you can do it from anywhere. Right. And then could you come back? We, we talked about this in one of the other shows. This is, seems a way off where then a doctor could respond and say, I know you're in, in the middle of a village in India or Africa or up in the highlands in Vietnam. We see you have a problem. There's somebody with some minimal training there. Can the doctor walk them through treatment or maybe even someday fantastically surgeries or other sorts of things? Could they somehow communicate back to the patient or to some minimally trained person to help intervene and offer some sort of treatments to these people? Or do you still have to fly doctors like Dr. Trin into the middle of these remote villages? I think it depends on the condition, right? Obviously, there's a point you, you don't want to go beyond. Um, right. But if you know the GPS coordinates of that person, you know exactly where they are. We do that today. Hmm. You just need permission to ping the person back. And I think you can do the second part. Right. The third part, so what if I gave you a little device and you could 
do a ultrasound on the patient mm. and the machine would tell you, okay, a little up, a little to the left, you no, know, move down, blah, blah, blah. And then the quality of the image is equivalent to a trained ultrasound technician. Wow. So AI will let the average person do that. Do wow. your own That's ultrasound at home. Yeah, like taking your yes. blood pressure. Yeah. Does that device exist today? That device exists. I just cannot remember the name of it right now, but wow. that device exists. Well, think about it, right? It, it, the ultrasound is doing what it's doing. It's just yeah. how do you position it to get the right image? And so yeah. the machine is looking at the image and going, no, no, move a little left, or, yeah. you know, a little down, a little to the right, and you get that result. Now, all of a sudden, the remote doctor has a, a clear image to make a better yep. determination off of. Mm -hmm. And so then can they be more accurate in their description to someone managing that patient? Right. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the big gap with telemedicine is that physical exam. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a few devices where, where patients can have this digital stethoscope and kind of put it on their chest and it records it and sends it to the doctor. But I think once we figure out how to do a physical exam from a distance, mm -hmm. that will complete the, the full circle of, of uh, virtual medicine it would be amazing. So I think 80% of the devices are there. I mean, there are, you know, there's now a urine analysis test where you can equivalently monitor yourself, your kidney, by the way, just got approved for kidney monitoring. Right. You just pee in a cup, put it on this little device, take a picture with your cell phone, the software will automatically diagnose it based on the color change on the little wow. card. Wow. And off you go, right? It's a company wow. out of Israel. Wow. Um, there are digital stethoscopes that are will hear things that there's no way that the human ear will easily hear, right? All of these devices are there. Are they integrated? No. But there, you know, many of them are there. And I would say that in the next right. I don't even want to say five years because that feels like an eternity yeah. these days. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like the next two or three years, you're going right. to, you know, people say, well, do you believe everybody's going to have a wearable? I'm like, well, if you don't have a wearable, you're like putting your life at risk. Mm -hmm. Like, Absolutely. would you drive a car without a dashboard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Good point. Interesting. Would you drive a car without a dashboard? Would you, would you blindly guess your speed? and uh, all the other parameters that go into operating a vehicle here. You're operating your body without any insight as to what's happening, just how you feel. Yeah, yeah. And there's an article, I don't know, every week there was one recently where the woman's Apple Watch, through monitoring of the heart, noticed that, that there was an aberration and she had actually had a tumor what? in her heart that was causing, yes, wow. just literally in the last 10 days, there was an article that came out on that. And I'm like, okay, if, you want, if you're not wearing it, yep. Wouldn't have caught you're it. sort of taking yeah. your life in your own hands. So Absolutely. it seems like we're going to get to a point where we're going to have some sort of wearable device. It's going to be monitoring us. It's going to be sending that data to some healthcare system provider, whatever of our choice. And that then they're going to respond quicker. They're going to get alerts. They're going to uh, make better diagnosis. And hopefully we'll not only reduce costs because we'll prevent emergency situations from happening, but we will increase results. How does that fit into, you? last question, you, you talked about a topic that I find fascinating, we've touched on on this show, the transition potentially from fee-based services, fee for service, you come, I see you, I bill you, and you don't come till you think something else is wrong. So it in, sort of encourages you to delay, to wait. I'll wait and see what it is. Is it serious enough for me to go pay for it? And so I put off and put off to this notion of value-based uh, medicine, which is all about results. I'm paying you for a result and it's up to you to roll the dice and figure out how to treat me. I'm going to give you a set fee. And for that fee, you better manage my care and don't come back and ask for $10 more or $10,000 more to do the operation. You know, you've agreed to monitor me and keep me healthy for a certain fee. Mm. What do you think about that? Does this help? get there? Does it give them more confidence to take that risk? Yeah. So if you look at, if you go back in time, when we went to the first start of precision medicine in oncology, I remember having a conversation with the FDA saying, and they were like, that's it. We're going to start asking for biomarker data from pharma companies because the technologies now makes right. it possible. Right. right. Those excuses of we can't do it no longer exist. Right. If you look at Medicare and Medicaid, they're moving towards value-based payments. And they're about 
50, 55% there, maybe a little higher at this point. Um, I haven't looked recently, right. but technology and monitoring allows you to keep the person in that band, right? right? And it becomes easier because it's not like you need to sit there and hold their hand. It's right. technology plays, plays a role in this. Now, right. of course, there's a bell curve. You know, there's the super like, I'm going to stay on track no matter what. There's the average person that's, yeah, yeah, yeah it's going to stay on track 80, 90% of it. And then there's a few people that are going to be like, listen, I'm going to smoke, I'm going to drink, I'm going to do whatever Can't I want. Can't stop me. Those right. are probably the people where we're going to go to them and say, that's fine. Here's your extra charge, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you're not staying in line and that's your own choice, mm -hmm. but do what you will. And that is now opening up, I think, in a big way. I think mm -hmm. physicians need to think more like a private equity firm mm -hmm. where how they optimize the outcome rather than the typical entrepreneur that's sort of, you're making a nickel on every mm -hmm. transaction, yeah, right. right? I think it's just a little different. Because that's what medicine, in my opinion, and we've kind of expressed this a little, I'm certainly no expert in this, just an average Joe when it comes to medicine here. But it seems like the system is set up to discourage me from using it. Because every time I go, I got to get, I get nickel and dime. And I go into the hospital mm -hmm. and I get this long bill for aspirin and for every time somebody touched me and everything else here and everything. So my incentive is to stay out of that system and stay away from it until I have no choice. And then I come rushing in and it's too late. Why didn't you see me earlier? Why didn't you prevent this sooner? Why didn't you adopt a different procedure? Because you're charging me every time I come see you. Okay, but here's, I think, the big difference. You were dependent on the system 100%, no matter what before. Right. These technologies now allow you to clue yourself into your own being. Yeah, there you go. And be more informed and maybe make changes yourself before you have to go into the system. Absolutely. Right. So right. it's empowering individuals to take charge of their own health care. Mm -hmm. Now, I still would say, listen, if you have a serious problem, please go see your doctor. Sure. But yeah. I've learned so much about my sleep and my workouts and my eating just from these technologies sort of giving me a clue, mm -hmm. right, into what's going on that I would have never have been able to do that without these capabilities. Much less if it was measuring my uh, formation of uh, can potential cancer cells and my genetic predisposition for things and, Absolutely. and my uh, spikes in blood sugar and other sorts of things here that you've talked about here. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point because we Amazing. all want to be more empowered. We all want to take more control of our own lives and be less dependent on others. That's just an American uh, ideal and, and a consumer ideal. And I think this allows you to do that, to be, you're driving the boat. Yeah. Love to have you back sometime, Harry, have uh, more discussions on this. This is a, uh, wow. Uh, this amazing talk. Thanks for coming on today. We appreciate it so much. Yeah. No, thank you so much for having me. You know, all of this stuff I talked about, I cover yeah. in the book, but I mean, there's so much going on that we could talk about. Yeah so many different aspects that I think people yes. can incorporate into their lives and make a difference. And give us the name of the book one more time. It's a long title, but it's got a lot to tell here. So <laughs> it's, it's the name of the book is the future you, how artificial intelligence can help you get healthier, stress less and live longer. There you go. Thank well. you so much. God bless. And uh, we'll continue this chat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it, another great example of why I got to tune in each and every time to Health Talks right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. Streaming live from the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center. 